Father, we love you and we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, you are with us. And this is a great, great Christmas Eve, Lord. We look and remember at your birth in Bethlehem so long ago, Lord. But Lord, we know you're not a babe in a manger today. No, you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. You finished the work that you came to do, Lord, so that we can know you in all your fullness, that we could be part of your family, Lord, as we surrender our will to your will, our hearts to your heart, Lord. We can be called children of God. Matter of fact, in John chapter 1, you tell us that you give us the power to be sons, daughters of God. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that, Lord. And if there's hesitation or so, anyone holding back today that's here or listening by broadcast, Lord, we pray, Lord, that their hearts would be tender to receive, Lord, your salvation this day. We thank you and praise you. Lord, speak your word, speak your will this day, this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we are talking about, and have been for the last couple of weeks, a series, God with us. God with us. Do you know God's with you? There's never a time he's not with you. I think it's somewhere in Psalms it talks about, uh, you know, all of these different situations and scenarios, whether I'm here or whether I'm there, whether I'm below the sea or above or in the depths of the heart of the earth, God is with me. He's always with us. He never leaves. He never forsakes. He's with you. And so we need to know that God is with us. And that's what he said in Isaiah 7, 14. The prophecy concerning the Lord. Am I cutting out? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Check, one, two, check. We are on. We are live. Here we are. So in Isaiah, talking about the prophecy concerning the Lord, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Let's go on to Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says this. That, uh, Isaiah was the prophecy. Matthew's the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. You know, the angels, they made a great announcement to the shepherds talking about the birth of Jesus, heralding his coming. They said, behold, we bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to just you few shepherds out here keeping the few sheep. No, which shall be to all people. All people include you and me. All people. For unto you is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And they went on to tell about the swallowing clothes and here's how you're going to find him. And then the angels, the angel that made that announcement was surrounded by a host, a multitude, an uncountable number of angels praising God, saying glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, to men. Listen. Listen. Peace on earth was God's announcement to you that my wrath towards sin is satisfied in this manger. The one who's worn there, the one who's going to live the life for you, 
the one that's going to take your sins to the cross, I give peace to you. Peace to you. And all we have to do is just believe that he's the one. He's the one. There are no other. God, uh, the, the scripture tells us that by, there's no other name by which men can be saved but the name of Jesus. That's the only name. Well, there's a bunch out there that you can follow. You're not going to find salvation in any of them. But the one who was in the beginning was the word. And the word was God, was with God and the word was God. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the, or verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God. That's the Lord. That's him right there. That's the one that was born in that manger. Can we trust it? Can we trust it? We're living in this modern world. How do I know all those scriptures are right? How do I know? Verse 22 said this, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled. That what might be fulfilled? This was Matthew chapter 1 verse 22. That all this might be fulfilled, that all this word spoken forth ages before Jesus was born, hundreds of years before he was born, might be fulfilled. We're going to look at that a little bit today. Is it possible to know without a doubt that Jesus is the Christ? Is it possible? My faith says yes. My faith says yes, and so does yours. But is, give me something undeniable, David. All right, all right, I will, I will. Do you know what quadrillions are? You ever heard that term? I know you've heard of hundreds. You've heard of thousands. You've heard of millions. You've heard of trillions. You heard of quadrillions? That's a lot, of, that's a lot, that's getting up there. And then there's something called a quintillion. What's that got to do with your message today? Everything. Everything, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you here in a minute, that it might be fulfilled. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. I just want to read that again. We don't give Joseph enough time. We talked about him the first week. He was a tecton. Did you know that? Joseph was a tecton. He was a carpenter. But the Greek word for carpenter in that verse is tecton. And tecton means more than just somebody that shaves woods and puts legs on tables. It means a much more than that. It means a craftsman. It means an artisan. It means somebody that builds, somebody that develops. It means an architect. It means a visionary. You know, if you're building... You're either building from a plan or you got to make it up as you go. You've got to see the end product before you start constructing because lumber is expensive today. It was expensive back then. Lumber hasn't changed in value. The price tag may have changed, but the value of it was great then just as it is great now. And you didn't want to waste material. You didn't want to waste stone because stone is labor. Man hours to quarry it, to bring it out, to chisel it, to refine it such that you can work with it. Oh yes, Joseph worked with stone too. That's what that tecton means. And, and so you don't want to waste time, waste money, waste resources. You want to use what's there. And so that's what Joseph did. Now Joseph was a good stepdad. I believe Joseph taught Jesus all his skills. I do. I believe that he set a good example. So let's go back and read, read a little bit about that. I believe Joseph set a very good example for Jesus. Verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother was espoused to Joseph, 
Before they came together, she was found with child. Before they came together, she was a virgin. They were not married. They were betrothed, espoused, committed to one another, but not married. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a just man, we got into that a little bit, he walked justly before the Lord. He walked righteously. He, he valued being just. It was a heart thing with him. He wanted to walk uprightly in his life, setting examples for others. He was a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. And you know, she could have been stoned. He could have had her stoned. By custom, by law, she could have been stoned, being found with child without marriage. But no, he didn't want to do that. It was just in his will to, to, to be kind to her and to be just to her, to put her away privily. But he thought on these things. He thought on these things. He pondered them. He rolled them over and over in his mind. It was on his heart. How can I or, or how to handle this situation? It wasn't a knee-jerk reaction with him. It was serious for him. He pondered on these things. And behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. He was of the line of King David. Matter of fact, his line goes all the way back, all the way back through Judah, and then, of course, uh, Jacob, and then Isaac and Abraham. And that's some of the prophecy. Those four families right there, David, Jacob, or Israel, um, Isaac, Abraham, are four fulfilled prophecies in Scripture concerning Jesus. Concerning Jesus. We'll get to that in a minute. And David... Uh, thou behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I believe she conceived when she told the angel Gabriel over in Luke, be it done unto me according to thy word. I believe that's when conception, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Mary said unto the angel, What? Be it done unto me according to thy word. Praise God. And that which was conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he, he shall save his people from their sins. Can you say amen to that? Yes, I say amen and amen to that one. He shall save his people from their sins. And all, now all this was done. Here it is that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Praise God. That it might be fulfilled. Praise God. About 30% or so of Scripture is prophetic is prophecy. And scholars tell us that there's three to, three to 400 uh, prophetic scriptures concerning Jesus. He's fulfilled, they say, over 300. How many does it take to, to verify that he is the Lord? Huh? In your life, how many does it take? Praise God. There was a king back in Prussia. Prussia was old Germany. His name was Frederick II. And in a conversation about religion, King Frederick asked a man named Hans Joachim von Zeiten, he was a cavalry general, whom he esteemed highly as a Christian, 
for his plain and uncompromised views. He said, give me proof. Give me proof for the truth of the Bible in two words. In two words. Give me the proof of the Bible. Could you do it? Could you do it? This is what General Zeiton said. He replied, Your Majesty, the Jews, the Jews. Now, I wanted to ask you a question. We started out week one. Week one, we talked about, um, let's see if I can find my notes here from week one. Week one, what did we talk about? Oh, here it is. Isaiah 9, chapter 6 was what we looked at. For unto you a child is born. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Listen to this now. That's a, and I made this point. It's strange that you're, we're talking about a baby being born and all of a sudden we're talking about the government. The government. Well, you know, most, most folks, especially about November, December time of year, government's the last thing we want to talk about. Tax time, paying your property taxes or April, huh? The government that spends way more than it has and takes way too much of what we got, right? We don't like talking about the government. Unto you a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's interesting to me. Is that interesting to you? It is interesting. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Let's continue. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Listen. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Of the increase of his government. He's a baby. He's, he's a baby born in a manger. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government's going to be on his shoulder. In the increase of his government, there shall be no end. It's coming. It's coming. His government is coming. His kingdom. Jesus said to Peter one time, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were... My servants would fight. At this time, his kingdom is not of this world. But it's not going to be long, folks. Have you looked at governments lately? Have you seen what's going on in the world? They're collapsing. They're collapsing. They are so corrupted, filled with corruption. All you got to do is look for just a moment and hear the lies and the deceptions, but there's no, there's no deception to the lies anymore. They're wide open. They're out there in the open. Folks, there's coming a government, and they're gonna, the government's going to rest on the Lord Jesus' shoulders, and of the increase of his government, there's not going to be an end to it. It's going to be an everlasting government, an eternal government. Praise God. And up, listen to this. Now, here it is. Of the increase of his government and peace. There's going to be, it's going to be a government of peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just judgment and with justice from henceforth even forevermore. Whose throne? The throne of David. Now let's remind ourselves who was David? King, he was king, King David, king of Israel. Actually, it was Judah, the kingdom. Uh, uh, hang on just a second. Let's think just a minute. No, it was all Israel at that time. It was all Israel at that time. And then King David passed, handed the kingdom to Solomon, and the, and the kingdom grew to its greatest extent at that point under Solomon. And then Solomon died and two sons warred. I think it was Jeroboam and Rehoboam, I believe. And the kingdom divided. And Israel hasn't been the same since. But whose throne is the Lord, Lord going to sit upon? The throne of David. 
And you know where he's going to rule from? The city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in the crosshairs of the world right now. Right now. I had a pastor years ago. He had taken about 30 or 40 uh, trips to Israel and carried people over there. He, his saying was this. When Israel sneezes, the world catches a cold. And that's true because the world is uh, focused or, or reactive to what's taking place over there in Jerusalem the, and Israel. Why is that? Because of the increase of his government, there will be no end. There will be no end. The Lord's coming back to establish his government. And he's not coming back as a babe in a manger. And he's already been to the cross. And if you read over there in Revelation, about chapter 19 or so, you'll see him come back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And his foot's going to step on the Mount of Olives. And when his foot sets back on this earth, it's not going to leave it. It will not leave the earth. He will not ascend again. He's going to come and stay. Folks, it's coming soon. Just look at the world. Look at what's going on. Can we trust that, David? Can we truly rely on it? Well, yeah, let's look a little bit further. So about 300 of script, uh, prophetic scriptures have been fulfilled by the Lord. We're going to look at maybe eight. Eight. Why eight? Well, there was a study done back in the 1950s by a gentleman named Professor Peter Stoner. And he created some calculations. He worked at Westmont College out in Santa Barbara, California. And he came up with some equations. And it boils down to this. I'm going to give you the punchline first, and then we'll look at the data. Eight. eight he, ran, he chose eight fulfillments of Scripture. Eight fulfillments of messianic prophetic scriptures do you know what the probability of that those eight occurring are one times 10 to the 17th power one times 10 to the 17th power now if you'll go online and do some research like I did you'll find that one times 10 to the 15th power is a quadrillion and one times 10 to the 18th power is a quintillion. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You know about as much as I uh, know what I'm talking, I'm saying. Because it's, it's not even vocabulary I normally use. I don't use those figures. Well, let, 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 me, let me say this. How many, if I counted uh, to quin, excuse me, hang on a second. If I counted a quadrillion seconds if I just counted if we if we watch the clock till one quadrillion seconds just you know on the clock what would that equate to do you know 32 million years 32 million years equals one quadrillion seconds well what about a quintillion well that would be um 32 billion years can you count that high? I can't either. So what is 1 times 10 to the 17th power in seconds? That would be, uh, there's quadrillion, there's tens of quadrillions, then there's hundreds of quadrillions. It would be 320 quadrillion years. No, three, three, see there? See there? Don't talk higher numbers with folks with the microphone in your hand because it gets, it just, whew. Folks, eight fulfillments of Scripture. Let, let me equate it to, to this. Y'all know what a silver dollar looks like. Do you know what the state of Texas looks like? Yes. If you covered the state of Texas with silver dollars, just run a layer of, uh, uh, of, of silver dollars all across the state of Texas and then stack it up two feet deep. And then you, one of those coins is marked with a special mark. And you are given the assignment, go find that coin and you only get one try. The chance of you finding that coin 
equals the fulfillment of eight of these prophetic scriptures. Does that bring it down to where we can live? I know what a silver dollar is. I know what Texas is. I've never walked the width and breadth of Texas. It takes you a day and a half to drive it, drive across it, top to bottom, side to side. I mean, it's huge. Does that, is it, what does it take to convince us that Jesus is Lord? Eight fulfillments. What are the eight that the man studied? Okay, let's look at that for a moment. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. The average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah. See, this was written in Micah 5, verse 2. Micah 5, verse 2 was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Hundreds of years before he was born in Bethlehem, Micah's saying the Savior's going to be born in Bethlehem. The average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to the present, which was 1958, divided by the average population of the earth during the same period, uh, gave him a number, 2.8 times 10 to the fifth power. All right, that, that's, that's, that's out there. That was fulfilled by Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. Micah said it would happen. It happened. Another one, messenger will prepare the way for the Messiah. We talked about John the Baptist last week. John the Baptist prepared the way for the Messiah. One man in how many the world over has had a forerunner, in this case John the Baptist, to prepare his way? How many men have had forerunners? Did you have a forerunner? I don't, I didn't. I had elder siblings, but I didn't have a forerunner. That number is one times ten to the third power. The Messiah will enter Jerusalem as a king riding on the donkey. Zechariah 9.9. 9. One man in how many who has entered Jerusalem as a ruler has entered riding on a donkey? How many? One times ten to the second power. The Messiah will be betrayed by a friend and suffer wounds in his hand. Zechariah 13.6. One man in how many... The world over has been betrayed by a friend, resulting in wounds in his hands. How many? One times ten to the third power. The Messiah will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah eleven twelve. Of the people who have been betrayed, one in how many has been betrayed for exactly 30 pieces of silver? One times ten to the third power. The betrayal... Money will be used to purchase a potter's field, Zechariah eleven thirteen. One in how many, after receiving a bribe for the betrayal of a friend, has returned the money, had it refused, and then, exper uh, then experienced it being used to buy a potter's field? How many? One times ten to the fifth power. Do you, are you getting the picture here? The Messiah will remain silent while he is afflicted. One man in how many, when he is oppressed and afflicted, though innocent, will make no defense of himself. One times ten to the third power. The Messiah will die by having his hands and feet pierced, Psalms 1, uh, 22, 16. One man in how many, since the time of David, has been crucified. One times ten to the fourth power. Those are the eight items that this gentleman through mathematical probabilities, the science, the science of statistics, the math of statistics, took these probabilities, and in multiplying all these probabilities together, produced a number rounded off of 1 times 10 to the 28 power, dividing this number by an estimate of the number of people who have lived since the time of these prophecies, 88 billion, produced a probability of all eight prophecies being fulfilled accidentally in the life of one person, that probability is 1 times 10 to the 17th power, or 1 in 100 quadrillion. What is all that? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is exactly who this scripture says he is. And those are just eight of the prophetic scriptures pertaining to scripture that got you to that astronomical impossible number. 
He's fulfilled over 300 prophetic scriptures. Jesus is Lord, folks. He is Lord. And I know numbers make our eyes cross, but that's the point. It's impossible for Jesus not to be Lord. That's the impossibility of it. And what we talked about earlier, Satan wants to deceive this world into thinking there's another way. God himself became one of us in that manger to live the life that was required of us so that he could die the death that we, that we owed because we couldn't keep it. We couldn't meet the standard. But you know what? His blood wasn't human, carnal. His blood, the blood flows through the Father. His blood was divine. That's, you know, in all of Jesus, Jesus' walk on this earth, he didn't walk around like God. He didn't walk around as God. He emptied himself and became one of us. And how did he do all the miracles? Read Acts 10, 38. He was anointed of the Holy Ghost in power, and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. The power of the Holy Spirit was upon him to minister, and he flowed in that power, in that anointing. But the one thing that, that's different about the Lord, his blood was pure. It was innocent. It was pure. It was God's blood that was shed on that cross that day. And that blood paid your sin debt. Paid your sin debt. That's something to really consider this Christmas. My sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did for me. And it's impossible for him not to be Lord. It is imp he is Lord. He is the Lord, Lord of all. Praise God. And I want to just remind you, he's not the babe in the manger anymore. No, he grew, and he went to that cross for you, and he died the death for you that you deserved, but he rose from the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave, and now he's seated at the right hand of God Almighty, and he offered his life to you and me, and his blood is living, and it is shed for the remission of all our sins, and all we have to do to have our sins forgiven is call on the name of the Lord, and you shall be saved. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you are so good. We praise your holy name. We praise you, Lord. Lord, your blood was shed for us for the remission of all our sins, Lord. And Lord, we believe that it, your blood cleanses us head to toe from every fault, every flaw, every guilt, every stain, Lord. We are washed clean by your precious blood. You said, Lord, that without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood is required because life is required. And that's what blood is, is the life, Lord. And you gave us your life when you shed your blood for us. You gave your life to us so that we could live with you, Lord. And so if there's anybody here this morning, just keep, continue to pray. Keep your eyes closed. If you just feel like, I need, I need to be washed in that blood. Scripture says in, in, in Romans 3.3, 3, it says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Or excuse me, it says that all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Every person that's ever been born has, been, has sinned. All of us. There's not an exception here. And Romans 6, 23 says that for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, the, the payment for sin is death, separation from God. We're all going to die physically, but we don't all have to die spiritually. We can be reborn spiritually. That's what John said, told Nicodemus in John 3, 3. He said, you must be born again. You must be born again. And so we need to understand, too, that Jesus died for us, Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died while we were enemies of his. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. 
And Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God. For with the heart, Romans 10, 9, with the heart, man believes unto the righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And that's what needs to transpire. Believing in the heart that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is risen from the dead. And then confessing him with your mouth that he is your Lord. Whoever does that is saved. Praise God. And I just want to open it up. If there's anybody here this morning that needs to do that, wants to do that, I will be here praying. Praise God. You can come forward if you will. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. He was Lord at his birth. He's Lord today. He is Lord of all. Lord, we thank you that you were born so long ago. You humbled yourself and you took on our form, Lord, and became one of us. You lived the life, Lord, that we were called to live but couldn't. You lived it for us. You died our death, Lord, so that we could receive your life. Thank you, Lord, for all that you did for us. We give you glory and praise and honor. As we go forth, Lord, we remember you. And we share you with others, Lord, this Christmas season. As we love our family and love our friends and share within this community, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for your blessings. For your glory, Lord, that you put in this earth, Lord. When the angels heard glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Merry Christmas, everybody.